The first talk today will be by Bob Gilbert. I think we all know Bob well from his writings and, of course, his book business, which in itself, um, because of the, the sort of books that Bob has uh, brought into his lists over the years and the help he's given people in tracing books, it, that in itself, just in the act of selling books, has been invaluable to many people uh, researching the, the, the occult traditions. So Bob uh, is going to speak on the literary heritage of the Golden Dawn. Thank you. I do hope that you had an uncomfortable night because I shall do my best to send you all back to sleep. What I'm going to talk about was really what the members of the Golden Dawn had done to preserve the ideas of the order. But I couldn't think of a suitable way of putting that into a title, so I started to call it the literary heritage of the Golden Dawn. And I thought that sounded about as dull as it's going to be. So <clears throat> I found a lovely little expression from a poet whose identity you may be able to guess, and I called it Golden Demons Whom None Can Stay, The Literary Heritage of the Golden Dawn. And this is it. One way of looking at the literary heritage of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn is to present a comprehensive list of everything written and published in book or periodical form by members of the Order. But if I were to do this and to chant an almost endless litany of unexciting titles, perhaps naming the publisher of each by way of response, you would render the quotation in my title rather more apt than it really is. And here I'd say it's actually taken from a poem by Blake, but I shan't tell you which poem. Anyone who can guess correctly its source will be given a free ticket to the Bicentenary Conference. <laughs> anyway, if I was to do that, you would rush from this hall, and those who weren't trampled in the rush would neither be stay nor be prepared to stay and to listen, so I shan't do that. Now let me begin by explaining what I mean by the term literary heritage. I'm not concerned here with the origins of the order, literary or otherwise, nor am I using the word literary strictly in the sense understood by literary critics, that is, literature identified as such by virtue of the elegance of its style, the skill of its construction and the lucidity of its language. I am concerned rather with the written word inspired by the Golden Dawn, both by virtue of the writer's membership of the order and by the influence of the ideas and ideals of the order on later novelists. I've separated those because coming from Bristol, when we say ideals, <coughs> we usually mean ideas, so I've given you both. The influence of those ideas on later novelists, poets and critics, whether they are good, bad or indifferent as most of them are as writers. Now, of these two aspects of the Order's heritage, I will consider first the work of the members. Of those who entered the Order between 1888 and 1903, at least 40 had published one or more books or had contributed one or more significant papers to a known periodical. By 1914, when the Golden Dawn as such came finally to an end, the number had risen to 60. But not all of these had been inspired to write by the Order. Some were established writers, either on the subject of occultism or more often on something more mundane. Others wrote during and after the time of their membership and yet betray no sign of the order's influence, <clears throat> although two who belong to this group refer specifically to the order in what they wrote. A smaller number wrote nothing until after their passage to the Golden Dawn and then wrote nothing about it. A few, however, both established writers and minor literati, were profoundly affected by the order and wrote either to propagate its views, both officially, in quotes, and unofficially, or more rarely to oppose and to attack it. But only one of them wrote exclusively about the order and its ramifications, and she was most certainly atypical, being more unbalanced than Mathers, and more credulous even than Aiton. For all that, she is, in terms of the literary heritage, far more important than is generally recognised, as we shall see. <clears throat> but let's take these three categories in order, beginning with the established writers. The founders of the Golden Dawn, Westcott, Woodman and Mathers, were all prominent members of the Societas Rosicruciana in Anglia. 
Dr. Woodman was its supreme magus, or head, <coughs> until his death in 1891. They were all well grounded in hermeticism and had all produced papers for the transactions of the Society's Metropolitan College. In the year that the Kabbalistically based Golden Dawn was conceived, both Mathers and Westcott had published books on the Kabbalah. Mathers, his partial translation of the Zohar, and Westcott, a version of the Sefer Yetzirah. This he continued to revise until 1911. But for neither of them was it a first appearance in print. Mathers had written and published his practical instruction in infantry campaigning exercise, following it in 1885 with a dramatic poem called The Fall of Granada. And he later went on to write a very trivial book on the tarot, called Fortune-Telling Cards, and a lot more, which I've printed but won't say. And to translate and edit two important magical texts, The Key of Solomon the King and the book of the sacred magic of Abramelin the Marg. Westcott was more prolific by a long way. His most important books were not esoteric but medical. He wrote, or rather co-wrote, many editions of the Extra Pharmacopoeia. And he also wrote a treatise on suicide, which is in a sense ironic because one of his daughters committed suicide later. <clears throat> in fact, virtually all his children died in tragic circumstances. He did write, however, far more on occult subjects than Mathers did. He wrote a little book on numbers, a book on the science of alchemy, an introduction to the Kabbalah, a translation of Eliphas Levi's Magical Ritual of the Sanctum Regnum, and something getting on for a hundred papers for a variety of different journals. He also edited the Collector Neo Hermetica, and I shall return to that later. But for all these works reflect the concerns of the order, Westcott and Mathers had created it, and can thus hardly be said to have allowed it to influence them. To some extent it's true to say that the influence of the Golden Dawn was the influence of its founders, at least as expressed in their published work because these achieved a wide circulation, much wider than the rituals did. At the same time, it must not be forgotten that they were only two among an enormous number of writers on occultism, and the general public would have gleaned little enough concerning the nature, or indeed the very existence of the Golden Dawn, from either the innocuous occultism of Westcott or the doubtful magic of Mathers. Within the order, they were exceptions, for they alone of all the members knew the truth of its origin and were impervious to the influence of its myth having been creators of that myth. <clears throat> now here I should say, it was pointed out to me last night, at least I think it was pointed out, as those concerned will see, that it would have been helpful to have had illustrations to the lectures. Now as I don't have slides to illustrate it, what I would suggest is that you all engage in acts of creative magical visualization. Every time <clears throat> that I mention a book, you can visualize the dust jacket up there. And as long as you don't start thinking about the artist and how it could have been changed, you at least will have something to break up the monotony of this long litany which I said I wasn't going to give, but which I am giving. Anyway, most of the other established writers who joined the order did not write on esoteric subjects, however enthusiastically they might pursue them. William Forsell Kirby, for example, was an eminent entomologist on the staff of the British Museum and a man with a penchant for obscure languages. He actually took a Greek motto. He called himself Genethito Fos. He was one of the few in the order to take something that wasn't Latin. And his dedication to the order is beyond question. He was in the second order. He joined it in 1897. He helped Waite on his road to Freemasonry, and he supported Waite's faction in 1903. So he was a very keen, very active supporter. But yet he wrote nothing at all on the occult. From 1862 onwards, he wrote, edited, or translated 31 works on natural history, produced a volume of poetry, and translated from French, Arabic, Estonian, and Finnish. The last was his most accessible work, and so anyone who wants to run around and collect everything done by people in the Golden Dawn can get this, because I haven't yet started buying them up. <coughs> he translated the Kalivala from the Finnish and it was issued in the Everyman's Library. But before you rush out and buy it, it's awfully dull. It does indicate his enthusiasm for the minutiae of folklore, but it gives no hint of his magical pursuits. And this, he's unlike his colleague, J.H. Slater, who also worked in the British Museum. <clears throat> he worked in the library. And he was actually initiated into the Golden Dawn on the same day as Kirby, on the 12th of July, 1895. Now, Slater published a work of fiction. 
He wrote two legal works because he was a barrister as well, 12 books on bibliography and book collecting, and he gave a paper to the Bibliographical Society in 1896 on some books on magic. And in this paper, he actually produced a, a magic circle and, and set it up for the time of day that he was giving the paper. But he'd only just joined the order, so he wasn't quite sure what he was doing. But he prepared this before he'd entered the second order, and it doesn't indicate that magic was still being worked, for all that he referred throughout the paper to Mathers and his, his writings. Nor, for that matter, does his last book, which is called Problems of the Borderland, which was published in 1915, and it has a splendid subtitle, an explanatory rendering of the introductory chapters of the Book of the Elements. Now, at this, you rush out and buy it, and then you throw it down in a rage, which is why they always turn up with battered corners. And in this, he outlines much of the theory behind Golden Dawn practices, insofar as it could be explained in terms of psychic ability, which is what he used as an explanation, rather than by way of the powers of hidden masters. Now, clearly, he was influenced by his sojourn in the Order, but it's his book is far too dull to have inspired anyone. Other people didn't even try. A man called J.H. Fitzgerald Molloy, who went rapidly into the second order but then stopped dead, and <clears throat> Miss Violet Chambers, who didn't go in and also stopped dead, wrote strings of more or less popular novels. But Molloy never turned to esoteric themes in his work, and Miss Chambers approached her Ghosts I Have Seen and The Cosmic Christ much later in life when she'd become Mrs. Tweedale, and long after she'd left the order. Her entry had followed shortly after the publication of her first novel in Lothian's Fields. <clears throat> and this is where I sort of crow over Mr. Howe, because he says she published nothing before she joined. Now, I've found that she did. It has got absolutely nothing to do with the order, and it just shows the sort of nonsense in which one can get bogged down, trying to prove points that don't count. Anyway, she resigned before she could write anything else. Now, other novelists included Florence Farr and Brodie Innes, but I'll return to them later. And also Anna Dunphy, who was the self-styled Comtesse de Bremont, whose fiction betrays no occult involvement, but who refers to her own and Constance Wilde's initiation into the Golden Dawn in her memoir, Oscar Wilde and His Mother. It is a most entertaining account. Miss Dunphy clearly had a sense of humour. She claimed that Constance had reported the ceremony and all details to her husband. And as a consequence, many of the members attributed the tragic events that befell her family to the breaking of her pledged word. Now, if that was so, we could justly attribute both the Ballad of Reading Jail and De Profundis to the malign currents of the Order's influence, but I doubt it. Miss Dunphy herself recognised the absurdity of the belief. What she said is, naturally such a conclusion was absurd for many reasons. But yet it goes to prove how dangerous the influence of occultism can be on the shallow-minded and superstitious, amongst whom she didn't include herself. She didn't go so far in the order, but Constance, in fact, didn't leave it until she'd reached the grade of philosophers. And in the address book, it has a little note saying, in abeyance with the sympathy of the chiefs. Now, among writers who might have been expected to show the influence of the order, if not to proselytize for it, was the astronomer Sir William Peck. Now, he wasn't Sir William in his Golden Dawn days. He didn't get his knighthood until 1917. But he didn't write anything except books on astronomy. And most of these were done either before 1893, when he joined, or after 1902, when he left, quote, in a ghastly funk over the Horos affair. Now, even the one paper that I've been able to identify that he contributed to the Scottish Lodge of the Theosophical Society uh, it's purely scientific. It's called The Evolution of a Planet. And as it's theosophical, one expects it to be full of lunar pitries and things like this. <clears throat> but it's, it's not. It's, it's very straight academic science. And he obviously used little slides which are identical with the illustrations in his books, which is how I was able to prove it was him. But <clears throat> she did write one book during the 1890s, a very large thing called the Observer's Atlas of the Heavens, which came out in 1898. And it has extremely accurate maps and very carefully drawn constellation figures. And it would be nice to assume that these were what were used by Westcott in preparing his star charts. But in fact, they couldn't have been because it was issued far too late. Westcott had prepared his charts years before that. 
And Westcott, in fact, almost certainly relied for his information on astronomy to, <coughs> for, to Sidney Turner Klein, who was a keen amateur astronomer with a fine private observatory at Stanmore, which is in Middlesex for those who don't know. He was a most eccentric and original interpreter of Masonic symbolism. And if you want to see what he wrote and got published, you can look at the pages of Ars Quatuor Coronatorum, which is a Masonic research journal. And he also wrote a series of obscure books on the mathematical theory of spirit. Now, he didn't call it that, but it's the only way I can begin to express it, because no one, either then or since, and presumably not the people who set the type, had the faintest idea what he was writing about. The books included one called Science and the Infinite, or Through a Window in a Blank Wall, which is a lovely subtitle, and a later one called The Way of Attainment. But contemporary critics, and occult critics at that, could not understand them, and they rejected his books lock, stock, and barrel. But he didn't affect the Golden Dawn, and it didn't affect him, for he never entered the order, <clears throat> he didn't enter the second order at all, and after two months, he joined in April 1896, he had got as far as the grade of Theoricus, and then he stopped and drifted away. When he went and where he went, we don't know, but he doesn't show any indication that he was ever in the order in what he wrote. Now, here I ought to emphasize two points which you might be tempted to overlook, and some enthusiastic people do overlook. First, the Golden Dawn didn't grow up out of nothing. It grew up in the middle of the occult revival. And you can't easily separate its unique features from the general range of occult concepts in which they were embedded. Well, I can't stress this too firmly. It's extremely important. Masters and Mahatmas were the stock in trade of the Theosophical Society as well as of the Golden Dawn. And you should remember that a great many members of the Golden Dawn were also active members of the TS. And writers could and did refer not only to such beings, but also to topics such as the Kabbalah, the Rosicrucians, astrology, alchemy, magic, and all the other things, without necessarily being involved in the order. All these and similar concerns were the common currency of the Western mystery tradition, and we should not forget that. Now, in addition, you must remember what Anna Dunphy said about the dread of members in the matter of oath-breaking, and that's significant very few of the members were willing to write about an order they respected and valued. That they feared the power of its suppositious secret chiefs restrained them all the more. They would not lightly or without permission seek to disseminate what they saw as the distinctive secret teachings of the order. Now, some of them did, and we shall see just what came of that. Now, now I must turn to those who were influenced by the order and who propagated its ethos with tremendous eagerness. Few of them had any impact on the literary world at large, and many of them, for all their importance in the order, wrote too little to influence the esoteric public. Dr. Henry Pullen Burry was for two years cancellarius of Isis Urania, and thus very active indeed, wrote a small medical work, Our Morning Bath. Now here I'd put up a slide, not of the book, as no one's ever found a copy of it, but you could have a picture of a bath and put somebody in it. So visualize that while I go on. And he wrote one solid book on Kabbalism, although that didn't appear until 1925, long after the author had fled to America. And when he fled, he left behind not only the order, but his family. His greatest contribution was a negative one, because he failed signally to persuade Conan Doyle to join the order. And he amused Doyle when he brought Dr. Felkin to see him. And they discussed, that is, Pullenbury and Felkin, their astral travelling. And this is what they said to each other, as reported by Doyle. When first you took me up with you, said Felkin, and we were hovering over the town I used to live in, in Central Africa, I was able for the first time to see the islands out in the lake. I always knew they were there, but they were too far off to be seen from the shore. Was it not extraordinary that I should first see them when I was living in England? To this, Pullenbury remarked, we had some fun in those days. Do you remember how you laughed when we made the little steamboat and it ran along the upper edge of the clouds? Well, Conan Doyle thought that this sounded like the talk of two lunatics. <laughs> but at least it guaranteed a permanent niche for the Golden Dawn, although he never names it, in an obscure corner of the lesser writings of at least one significant figure in English literature. So there's one little bit of heritage. Now, Pullenbury had a wife whom he deserted, 
And Rose Pullenbury was more successful than her husband, as she had to be, because she had to find a living. Now, Annie Horniman helped her to some extent after she'd been left by her husband, but she also turned out quite a respectable number of books. She wrote five travel books and three novels. The last of these, in fact, the novels, that is, came out in 1897, just before her husband's flight, and it had a somewhat prescient title. She called it Blotted Out. Now, they weren't the only literary married couple in the order. Now, Dr. Felkin and his wife had both written and translated books about African travel, but only the doctor had written on tropical diseases. Married couples were not confined to Isis Urania, but those in Horus Temple at Bradford, and there are several there, were perhaps too down to earth to indulge in writing. Indeed, the Horus members wrote very little. No books were produced from their ranks, although Thomas Pattinson began to contribute a translation of the Golden Chain of Homerus, which is adapted from Backstrom's version, to the pages of Lucifer, it was never completed. His contemporary, a man named William Williams, who had a very strange motto, which I've not been able to translate, which is, as well as I can pronounce it, Norho de Manhar, produced an annotated translation of parts of the Zohar, which appeared in an American theosophical journal, The Word. And that has been reprinted in full, the, the text of his articles. And it didn't make any impact, or he didn't, because when the reprint came out, the editors solemnly assure us that nobody knows who he was. And <clears throat> I must admit, beyond his name, I know nothing of him either. But some of the members were in a different class. They were enthusiastic, they were inspired by the order, and they could write good English. Westcott recognized their talents and called upon two of them to assist him in the preparation of his series of texts of the greatest value in hermetic research, that is, the Collecta Neo Hermetica. Now, the editors and authors remained anonymous because they used only the initials of their order mottos, but they can easily be identified. Percy Bullock, or Livavi Oculos, was one of the most prominent members of Isis Urania, and he translated and edited the Somnium Scipionis and provided an introduction for the Chaldean oracles of Zoroaster. He also wrote a paper on hermetic philosophy for the theosophical journal Theosophical Siftings, and he contributed reviews to the Theosophical Publishing Society's book notes, which was an interesting thing in its own right, because book notes included lists of books for sale, and as the TPS began to lose interest, so the editor got more enthusiastic and began to sell books on his own account, and that was J.M. Watkins, and that was the origin of Watkins' bookshop. <clears throat> but Bullock's wife, Pamela, was equally enthusiastic and active in the order, but she published absolutely nothing until long after the order had passed away. And in 1923, Watkins, who had, of course, published little reviews by her husband, issued a little play called An Advent Mystery. But much as I would like to have seen it, it doesn't ever seem to have been performed. Those who are enthusiastic might like to take it up and present it somewhere where the rest of us don't have to be. <coughs> now, the other of Westcott's aides was very different. Soror Sapientia Sapienti Dono Data, or Mrs. Emery, or Florence Farr, as we should perhaps call her, was a fervent believer in the importance of the beliefs and practices of the order and acted as its most effective apologist for she was a much better writer than either Westcott or Mathers. She edited and introduced two of the alchemical titles in the series, one a short inquiry concerning the hermetic art, and the other Thomas Vaughan's Euphrates. She also wrote Egyptian Magic, which was the most important of the series' nine titles, and the new edition of which was introduced by Timothy Dark Smith. <coughs> she followed this with The Way of Wisdom, which is subtitled, An Investigation on the Meaning to the Letters of the Hebrew Alphabet Considered as a Remnant of Chaldean Wisdom. But that's an extremely rare book and very, very difficult to find. She also wrote a series of remarkable articles that appeared in the Occult Review during 1908. They all concerned symbolism and the use of the imagination in various esoteric traditions. And one of these is extremely important. It was called On the Play of the Image Maker. It's an extraordinary statement of the nature of ecstatic and mystical experience. If I quoted from it, in part, it would lose its force, as it's one of those things that has to be absorbed rather than read. It seems the most appropriate way of putting it. 
to really to be appreciated. But as with all this sort of writing, it was passed by because readers of the occult review <coughs> were rather like readers of prediction. They're concerned largely with sensation and event. They don't really wish to be made to think and to feel. But as a justification of the purpose of the Golden Dawn, the play of the image maker stands alone. But as nobody understood it, so no one was influenced by it. Her other work was more directly literary. Her novels were not in any sense esoteric, but the plays that she wrote with Olivia Shakespeare certainly were. Both The Beloved of Hathor and The Shrine of the Golden Hawk emphasize the Egyptian preoccupations of hers and many other order members. They may fail as plays, but as statements of belief, they most certainly succeed. She also edited in 1910 a calendar of philosophy, which contained, among many others, 15 quotations each from A.E. Waite and W.B. Yeats. Now, the linking of Yeats and Waite and Florence Farr is one of the things that justifies Roger Paris's argument. <clears throat> but the calendar of philosophy also included a number of paragraphs from an Egyptian work called The Instruction of Tahotep. And this was one of four, of four possible translations. She used one that had just been published by a man called Batiscum Gunn. The point about him is that he had also joined Waite's Independent and Rectified Rite earlier in the same year that his book was published. Now, he was a competent Egyptologist. He was also a competent Hebraist. And although he didn't write very much, he had quite a considerable influence within the later order. Now, the other Egyptologist was a man called Marcus Worsley Blackton, who seems to have done more than any other to propagate Egyptian concepts both within and without the order. He certainly wrote and published far more on Egypt than Mathers ever did. And he also was a professional Egyptologist, which is something <coughs> people often don't realize. There was one other little book on Egypt by a man called Sidney Corin, who was also in the Second Order, who in 1913 published a book called The Faith of Ancient Egypt. But it's only a, an inconsequential thing. And in any case, it was published in America. Blackton <coughs> had been employed by the Archaeological Survey of Egypt in the 1890s to copy tomb paintings, and he had worked at both Beni Hassan and El Berche. He also published, on his own account, with a colleague, a collection of hieratic graffiti, <coughs> which were taken from the alabaster quarry of Hatnob at Telelamana. Now, it may have been this, these graffiti, that started him off on his quest for proof that the cipher manuscripts could be authentic by being able to show that the Fellahin may have preserved ancient Egyptian and thus ancient Egyptian could have been known at the time the cipher was allegedly written. Now, I think his argument is far-fetched. Waite thought it was far-fetched and they had a tremendous row about it. That you can read in elsewhere anyway. Well, whether he was correct, he wrote on his actual work, on his experiences in Egypt for Horlick's magazine, which was edited by Waite, he published Translations and Studies of the Book of the Dead in the Theosophical Review in a curious little astrological journal called Coming Events. Now, Coming Events is the most odd thing. It only ran for a few volumes in the late 1890s, but in every issue it contained at least one or more articles by members of the Golden Dawn, none of them on astrology, on the most curious subjects, but none of them were signed. They just had initials. It's easy enough to identify them, <clears throat> but it's a very difficult thing to find, and it's a thing that's probably worth trying to be dug out and reprinted. That is very much on our side. In 1914, Blackton published the one book for which he was solely responsible. He wrote entirely himself. This was called The Ritual of the Mystery of the Judgment of the Soul. And it was, in a way, partially responsible for the downfall of Waite's independent and rectified right. And if that had not collapsed, and if Waite had not gone on to found his Fellowship of the Rosy Cross and to lose interest totally in the old Golden Dawn, it's unlikely that we would have known anything like as much about the Golden Dawn as we do, because Waite would have preserved the papers much more carefully and ensured that they were never made public. So in a sense, we can say that Blackton's work is extremely important in the heritage of the Golden Dawn, because without it, in a curious negative way, we wouldn't have many of the documents that we do. But he figures elsewhere, besides in his own writing. In Yeats's autobiography, The Trembling of the Veil, 
<clears throat> he records how he received a vision of a galloping centaur and of a woman shooting an arrow at a star. Now, this was partially explained for him by Westcott, but it was further analyzed by, <clears throat> quote, one of my fellow students, a yachtsman and yacht designer and Kabbalist. Now, no one has ever been able to work out who this man was. There were never any records to show who among the Golden Dawn members was a yachtsman and possibly a yacht designer. But it turned out by accident <clears throat> that there are references in, in various sources, in letters and in Waite's diaries, to Blackton being off sailing on his yacht when he should have been active and helping Waite <clears throat> cause the schism of 1903. And he actually moved to Fawley in Hampshire so he could be nearer the water and nearer his yacht. So in a sense, like Pull and Burry, although in, without even being named, Blackton too has earned himself a niche in great literature. Well, talking about the schism of 1903 brings us to the remaining figures. Now, going back a little from that, W.T. Horton doesn't need much mention because his work began after he had gone into and rapidly out of the Golden Dawn. A book of images, which is his most important, as well as being his first book, appeared in 1898. And he disliked the order to such an extent that it finds no place in anything he wrote subsequently. Falcon confined his esoteric writing to privately published journals, at least until he was settled in New Zealand. When he was there, he published in 1918 a book entitled The Sacramental System, <clears throat> now, I have never seen it. I assume that it is correct, and it wasn't really the sacral system and about people's broken backbones. The other major figure of the events of 1903 was J.W. Brodie Innes, and his work is important. His literary career began in 1877, long before the Golden Dawn, with a play called Thomas a Beckett. And it continued with a series of pamphlets for the Set of Odd Volumes, which was a London literary club. <clears throat> the last he wrote for them was a little book on Scottish witchcraft trials, which was one of his abiding interests because that combined both nationalism, his legal career, and his esoteric pursuits. So he got it all rolled into one. But his opinions on esoteric subjects found expression far more often than in this little literary club because he can be found in every issue of the journal called the Vahan, which was a vehicle for the interchange of theosophical opinions and news. People would write in saying, what is this, what is that? And various people were invited to respond. And Brodie Innes always responded at length. <coughs> but he also achieved permanence in the shape of his book called The True Church of Christ, Exoteric and Esoteric. It's a difficult book, but he wrote other things too. And he deserves recognition for this. But he seems to have been just as keen on his literary club as he was on the Golden Dawn. And he often took his friends as guests. On one occasion at least, he took Yeats. And frequently, he took Bram Stoker. Indeed, Stoker, although he's never a member of the Golden Dawn, evidently helped Brody Innes in his writing. For Innes had turned to supernatural fiction as a medium for the expression of his talents, such as they were, and between 1908 and 1919, he wrote six novels, commencing with Morag the Seal and ending with The Golden Rope. But he refined his style throughout with the aid of Bram Stoker. In fact, The Devil's Mistress is dedicated, I quote, to the memory of my dear friend, the author of Dracula, to whose help and encouragement I owe more than I am at present at liberty to state. And it's tempting to think that Dracula itself drew its characters from the ranks of the Golden Dawn. And if that was so, it'd be even more interesting to speculate who was the model for the Count. But unfortunately, it is not so. Well, Brodie and his novels were popular in their day, They're popular in the sense they were reprinted, and anyone who writes a novel that gets reprinted can be sure they've been successful. <clears throat> but he can't be said to have spread the ideas of the Golden Dawn, because they don't really occur in his fiction. They, they were mostly historical. Other fiction certainly did affect people. Arthur Macken's supernatural fiction cannot be claimed for the order. And much as those who were Macken fiends wish it could, he'd written his novels before he was a member. And if they betray any occult content, it's because of his having worked for Redway and having read so many occult books. 
<clears throat> it's very much a product of the 90s, and they are that type of fiction. They're certainly not in any sense related to the Golden Dawn. Algernon Blackwood, who came in about the same time as Macken, was influenced, and through him, other people too. After the schism of 1903, Blackwood sided with Waite, and although he was never very active, he did remain in the order, because what's not generally known is that he was a founder member of Waite's Fellowship of the Rosy Cross, by which time he'd have reached the grade of Adeptus Minor, but we don't know anything about the <coughs> detailed day-to-day -day running of Waite's branch of the Golden Dawn, because there is no minute book surviving. Anyway, <coughs> Blackwood produced his novel The Human Chord in 1910, and that embodies many of the essential concepts prevalent in the Golden Dawn. The idea of becoming as, of, as gods and the idea of words of power, they're all found in The Human Chord. But that novel was dramatized and broadcast on, on the BBC, and I've listened to the broadcast twice, and it doesn't seem like the same book. It doesn't seem the same at all, because all the occult elements are omitted, and it's treated virtually as a kind of primitive science fiction, and utterly spoiled as a consequence. I, it says here, quote here if needed, you don't need the quote, so I shan't give it. But Blackwood's greatest contribution to the heritage of the Golden Dawn was his refinement of the fictional character of the psychic detective. Now, he didn't, as he's often thought, create psychic detectives. They did exist before. There was a man called Wirt Gerard in the 1890s who produced a little book, the title of which I can never remember, which included a very odd character who supposedly rescued people from psychic involvement, but he was very, very theosophical. And then there were the people who wrote under the pseudonym of Ian H. Heron, who produced a character called Flaxman Lowe, <coughs> who was, if anything, the sort of character you wish had been wiped out by his occult enemies. He was a loathsome man. But they were not occult in, in the sense of any of the Golden Dawn pursuits. But Blackwood's character was. His character was called John Silence, physician extraordinary. And he embodied all the characteristics of the ideal adept. And here I will read you something that was written about him. In Blackwood's own words, he decided that <coughs> John Silence, in order to grapple with cases of this peculiar kind, he had submitted himself to a long and severe training, at once physical, mental, and spiritual. What precisely this training had been, or where undergone, no one seemed to know, for he never spoke of it, as indeed he betrayed no single other characteristic of the charlatan. But the fact that it had involved a total disappearance from the world for five years, <clears throat> that after he returned and began his singular practice, no one ever dreamed of applying to him that so easily acquired epithet of quack, spoke much for the seriousness of his strange quest and also for the genuineness of his attainments. Well, of course, he was recognized as well, not just by his creator and the readers, but by the people he opposed. <clears throat> and in the story Secret Worship, the victim is about to be destroyed when he is rescued at the last minute, and he sees the face of John Silence. It was a face of power, of simple goodness, and in his despair and abandonment he called upon it, and called with no uncertain accents. He found his voice in this overwhelming moment to some purpose, though the words he actually used, and whether they were in German or English, he could never remember. Their effect, nevertheless, was instantaneous. The brothers understood, and that grey figure of evil understood. For a second, the confusion was terrific. There came a great shattering sound. It seemed that the very earth trembled. But all Harris remembered afterwards was that voices rose about him in the clamour of terrified alarm. A man of power is among us, a man of God. That was John's silence. Now... <clears throat> He, of course, was essentially good and fights actively against evil. And in this, he was emulated by Dr. Taverner, who, as you know, was the hero of Dion Fortune's The Secrets of Dr. Taverner. And he outwits and defeats all manner of evil adepts and alien entities with the aid of an unnamed magical order. Now, in Alan Richardson's new biography, Priestess, he's argued that the lodge to which Taverner refers was Masonic, <clears throat> and this, it clearly was not, because if one reads carefully what Dion Fortune wrote about Dr. Taverner, there's no way in which this can be read as a Masonic Lodge. 
In the story The Powerhouse, <clears throat> the, the hero defeats a magician named Josephus, but who's quite clearly based on Alistair Crowley. And the description of Taverner's preparation for this doesn't fit a Masonic lodge, not to my knowledge anyway. Taverner opened his suitcase and took out the most wonderful robes I have ever seen in my life. Stiff with embroidery and heavy with bullion, the great cope looked like the mines of Ophir in the shaded light of that sombre room. Taverner put it on over an emerald green soutane, and I fastened the jeweled clasp upon his breast. Then he handed to me, for he could not raise his arms, the headdress of Egypt, and I placed it on his head. I have never seen such a sight. The gaunt lineaments of Taverner, framed in the Egyptian drapery, his tall figure made gigantic by the cope, and the jewelled ank in his hand, made a picture which I shall remember to my dying day. And as I'm sure you all remember that picture of Mathers in his Egyptian robes, if you can envisage that with the ears a little reduced, you'll have a picture of John. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, what he does, does not conform, to the best of my knowledge, to any known Masonic practice. He's deconsecrating the temple and, and driving out the evil that Josephus has produced. Taverner returned to the altar. Then from under his cope, he produced a curiously wrought metal box. He opened one end and took out of it a handful of white powder and strewed it upon the altar in the form of a cross. Unclean, he said. His voice was like the tolling of a bell. He opened the other end of the box and took out a handful of ashes. And these also he strewed upon the altar, defiling its white linen covering. Unclean, he said again. He stretched forth his ank, and with the head of it extinguished the lamp that burnt upon the altar. Unclean, he said a third time. And as he did so, all sense of power seemed to leave the room. He became a flat, ordinary, and rather tawdry. Taverner alone seemed real. All the rest were make-believe. Now that, to me, is proof positive that she was talking about the work of the Golden Dawn. Now, other representations of the Order, or its pursuits in fiction, vary in terms of their success. Evelyn Underhill was never happy with fiction. When she departed from things esoteric in about 1912, she left her fictional magic behind her. Now, Marjorie Lawrence, who was never in the Golden Dawn, or in any of its derivatives, created a successor to Dr. Taverner in Miles Penoyer, another soul doctor who battles with and overcomes the forces of darkness. But he, alas, is also out of print, little known, and has encouraged no one to carry on the torch of what one might call muscular white magic. Indeed, only one writer of fiction has utilized esoteric concepts successfully, and if not in the Golden Dawn, he was active in Waite's Fellowship of the Rosy Cross. That, of course, is Charles Williams who published seven novels between 1930 and 1945. Now, all of them are devoted to rather somber occult themes, and they all display a considerable specialist knowledge. He does not, however, use the theme of an occult order, although it may be seen as implicit both in War in Heaven and, to some degree, in The Greater Trumps. His one full portrayal of a magician is more effective, to my mind, than either Blackwood's or Fortune's. Simon the Clark, in All Hallows' Eve, illustrates the real implications of spiritual evil. It becomes repellent by its inhumanity. And I will again quote what he said. This is <coughs> Simon the Clark, the black magician in All Hallows' Eve. His books and divinations had told him, and the lesser necromantic spells he had before now practiced on the dead had half shown him what he might expect to see. As he approached after the graded repetitions, the greatest and most effective repetition, <clears throat> and the very centre of that complex single sound, he expected, visible before him, the double shape, the all but dead body, the all but free soul. They would be lying in the same space, yet clearly distinct. With the final repetition of the reversed name, they would become still more distinct, but both at his disposal and subject to his will. He would divide without disuniting, one to go and one to stay, the spiritual link between them only just not broken, but therefore permanent. Now, he is not very nice at all. And as Charles Williams is currently being shaken by American literati in the manner that a terrier shakes a rat, 
So awareness of the Golden Dawn, and with it the misconception that Williams was a member, grows in the academic mind, and he is thus a most significant part of the Order's heritage. Now at this point you will be growing restive. You will be aware that I have encanted a good many of the unexciting titles, but I didn't give you the publishers. And aware also that I have not mentioned the work of the three names whom the general public might be expected to recognize, to associate with the Golden Dawn, and who could thus be said to constitute the mainstream of its heritage. This I have done deliberately. Just as iced buns are kept back at a nursery party, so I have kept back Wait, Crowley, and Yates. Mathers and Westcott may have created the Golden Dawn, but these three decisively molded our perceptions of it, each in an utterly different way. Crowley, by exposing the rituals of the order to public gaze, and thus setting a precedent for later renegades and exiles to follow, wait by altering its direction and thus drawing into its orbit those who would never have accepted its original form, and Yeats by virtue of refusing to change at all. Crowley, of course, passed into the order, took up what he wanted, and passed out of it. But had he not entered it, there would have been no intellectual base for his Iwas experience, whether you see that as vision, hallucination, or calculated fraud. There would have been no Argentina Astrum or OTO, and I say that in the sense that although it existed before, it would not have had its present form without him. No equinox. While I would certainly be glad to relinquish the foolish posturing that you find in that, I would be very unhappy to lose its mordant wit. And no magic with a K. And where would that leave us? Why, it would leave us nowhere with no raison d'etre, for it was Crowley's antics that kept the order alive in the public mind. Those outraged pillars of society who bayed for his blood saw the Golden Dawn as part and parcel of Crowley's telemism. And it is the outraged of today who keep that fictitious link alive, aided and abetted by the burgeoning ranks of conspiracy theorists. As far as the Golden Dawn is concerned, all of this stems ultimately from the anti-Semitic ravings of Nestor Webster. First in the columns of the Patriot, which is the most inaptly named newspaper ever of 1920, and later in her book, Secret Societies and Subversive Movements. What has never been made clear is that her source of information on the Golden Dawn was that manic ruling chief of the mother temple of the Stella Matutina and RR at AC, otherwise known as Miss Christina M. Stoddart, who published her own delirious account of the order in 1930 as light bearers of darkness. Now, for some inscrutable reason, conspiracy theorists treat this book as holy writ. They prefer it even before such choice eccentricities as the quasi-fiction of Robert Anton Wilson, who wrote Master of the Illuminati and other such books, and the unintended fictions of Powells and Bergier, whose dawn of magic has Yeats parading in mask, dagger, and kilt, with both Bram Stoker and Sax Roma among his followers. Nor are public perceptions of truth helped when false echoes of the order filter into modern fiction, as in To the Devil a Daughter. I call it modern in the sense that it seems modern to me, but I sometimes forget how old I am. <clears throat> now, in that, Dennis Wheatley's hero tells the Satanist, Canon Copley Sile, who is quite clearly modelled on Montague Summers, that, I quote, I have eight circles and three squares. It's like playing marbles, you see. <laughs> really, rejoins the Canon, then you are past the abyss. A pity indeed, to my mind, that both hero and creator had not fallen into it. <laughs> but the legacy of Crowley, latter-day equinoxes, harsh telemic mag magical text, and a rather colourful approach to public and private morality, are not truly a part of the heritage of the Golden Dawn. One thing, however, I would claim, Crowley's delightful bon mot on Westcott's role as a coroner he was, said Crowley, paid to sit on corpses, not to raise them. <laughs> Waite was altogether different. He eschewed magic utterly, and his viewpoint was publicly known long before he entered the Golden Dawn. The old order had no effect upon him. And just as Mathers and Westcott were creators, so was Waite with his own independent and rectified right. It drew in what I would like to call ritual mystics, and when they left, they were undoubtedly altered. 
Evelyn Underhill, for example, for all she protested to the contrary, was deeply affected by Waite's thought, <clears throat> as was the Masonic writer W.L. Wilmshurst, although he later fell away from Waite and came to disagree with him. Other active supporters of Waite included A.H.E. Lee and D.H.S. Nicholton, the editors of the Oxford Book of English Mystical Verse. At this point, I nearly said the Oxford Book of English Ghost Stories, but I can't think why. <laughs> And although their own works are almost unknown, which is a crying shame in the case of Daniel Nicholson, they're important because of their encouragement of Charles Williams in his enthusiasm for Waite's ideas, which he picked up mostly from the secret tradition in Israel. Today it is Williams, more than any other writer, who has unconsciously, for he never referred to the order in his writing, led the literary establishment to the Golden Dawn. I repeated this point because I think it's worth stressing. That the Golden Dawn itself was a passing phase, even for weight, which should be remembered, does not seem to occur to them, as it does not either to the growing band of Arthur Macken dilettanti, <clears throat> who tend to see the order looming larger over Macken than ever it did during his lifetime. Macken's real attitude to the Golden Dawn was expressed succinctly in one word, in things near and far. The order was, he said, a stumor. Now you might say... What about the House of the Hidden Light? Because <clears throat> this is always reckoned to have been a great work on the Golden Dawn. Well, it most certainly was not. The House of the Hidden Light was written conjointly by Macken and Waite. And although people like Ethel Cahoon have always insisted that what it actually is is an account of, of tantric sex magic, it does have a sexual element, but it's rather the junketings of Macken and Waite around London with their respective lady friends. I might add that in due course, Macken quite properly married his. Waite couldn't because it was his sister-in-law who was already married to someone else. <laughs> <coughs> but it had nothing to do with the Golden Dawn. It was a much more earthly pursuit. Now, Waite has also been claimed as an influence upon T.S. Eliot on the basis that it was the Waite Rider Tarot specifically that inspired the tarot section in the Wasteland. Now, perhaps it did, but the tarot cards are Waites, not the Golden Dawns. And the imagery had already been filtered through Jesse Weston's Grail theories and through her somewhat curious mind before it reached Eliot. And he drew, in any case, as do all great artists, upon a multitude of sources. Waites' cards may have inspired him, and Waite unquestionably used symbols from the Golden Dawn in constructing his designs. But we cannot claim Eliot as part of the Golden Dawn's heritage. And here I will make again the point about the common currency of occult ideas, because I don't think it can be stressed hardly enough. The use of Kabbalistic, Rosicrucian, or alchemical imagery does not of itself indicate the influence of the Golden Dawn. Both Malcolm Lowry's Under the Volcano and Joyce's Finnegan's Wake have been alleged to have a Kabbalistic structure, or at least to contain Kabbalistic elements, but neither author can be remotely associated with the Golden Dawn. The works of Yeats, however, can. Yeats undoubtedly was shaped by the Golden Dawn. Not that it created his genius, for that would have flowered wherever his wanderings took him. But the content of his work, its imagery, and much of its purpose was determined by the order. Without the Golden Dawn, we would still have Yeats the poet, Yeats the playwright, and Yeats the essayist, but it would be a very different Yeats indeed. Gone would be Rosa Alchemica and his essay on magic. Gone, too, would be the trembling of the veil and his impassioned pleas to the second order. And gone would be that maddening, unknowable creation of vision. But did not Yeats himself say of that, perhaps this book has been written because a number of young men and women, you and I among the number, that is, Vestigia, met nearly 40 years ago in London in Paris to discuss mystical philosophy. And that's the essence of it. This is the heart of the Golden Dawn's heritage. It encapsulated the whole of the hermetic spiritual tradition of the West. It united it with the myth of Christian Rosenkreutz, which is perhaps the most powerful myth the West has had, and transformed the whole into something which can truly be called magical. Yeats expressed this rather more poetically in Rosa Alchemical, Alchemica, where he says, Then an old woman came, leaning upon a stick, and sitting close to them, took up the thought where they had dropped it, having expounded the whole principle of spiritual alchemy, <clears throat> and bid them found the order of the alchemical rose, 
she passed from among them, and when they would have followed was nowhere to be seen. And so it is. The order has gone, and in a thousand fleeting ways it makes its presence known in literature and in art. It has gone, but yet it will not go away. 